All right, all right, all right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Jason, and this is my beautiful wife, Katie. Katie, you've got a fun story for us today, and uh, a classic, if you will, when it comes to metas, serial killers, and just kind of, eventually it, it ends up like enveloping everything that uh, we go over but for today we're just going over the story yes Um, so why don't you uh share with us what we're what we're talking about today august 8th 1969 was an excruciatingly hot day in the benedict canyon of california a heat wave had been persistent for most of that summer and on that evening when the temperature did not dip below 92 degrees sharon tate a 26 year old actress most famous for her role in the film valley of the dolls who was eight and a half months pregnant, was trying to survive, wearing nothing but a pajama set that was more akin to a bikini than traditional sleepwear. Her husband and the father of her unborn son, Roman Polanski, was currently away working in Europe. As such, Polanski's friend, Warchek Frykowski, and his girlfriend, Abigail Folger, yes, the heiress to the Folger Coffee Fortune, along with Tate's former boyfriend, a male hairdresser named Jay Sebring, were staying with the actress. By daybreak, August 9th, not a single member of the foursome would be alive. Tate herself would be hung and stabbed numerous times, an ominous message written in her blood on the front door. Today, we are going to discuss the story of Charles Manson, his family members, and the crimes that made them all infamous. All right. Charles Manson, man. Um, And I'm just going to warn you, there are a ton of names in this episode. You don't have to keep them all straight. Yeah. Well, this one I should uh, should be good on because, I I mean, I've definitely watched documentaries on it. It's, uh, It's a weird one because he didn't touch any of the knives that killed people. Right. But he's tied to multiple, not just that instance either. Um, that instance though, I mean, it's, it's had so much, uh, effect on media and music and pop culture, pop culture. Um, I mean, once upon a time in Hollywood. I know. (laughs) I feel like for some of our listeners, they're going to be like, wait, (laughs) that's not actually what happened. Wait, Sharon Tate dies? (laughs) Like, no. Brad Pitt is supposed to save her. Brad Pitt didn't save the day. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Sharon Tate dies. Yeah, she does. And brutally. Um, Nine Inch Nails. uh, You you know that band. Um, They recorded one of their albums in that house oh my gosh uh, nobody I, I i don't know if anybody owns it now but nobody i actually owned think it it's time, currently for it's, sale yeah somebody feel, always owns it but um, i feel like i saw that yeah is that it's currently for sale that's a fun fact about that another fun fact is uh roman polanski's still in europe and um he can't come back to the u.s unless he wants to so he's kind of a dirtbag now yes <laughs> But let me tell you. He so probably isn't now because he's so old. Roman Polanski, both of his parents died in the Holocaust. Yeah. Then his wife, they were married, with his unborn first child, are brutally murdered. So, like, yes, he's a dirtbag and there's no excuse for it. He might but have got fucked boy, up a little bit. Golly, yeah. what a life. Yeah, what a life for sure. And he makes he's a brilliant filmmaker. He really is. Um, uh, I'm totally spacing some of the films but i will think of them um <laughs> oh rosemary baby isn't that roman polanski i think that's yeah. roman polanski yeah yeah uh i mean he's he's still making films i think he's winning awards still his yeah. films get yeah you can't come collect academy them. awards you gotta mail them off but um yeah. yeah the police can't even like trap him that way no <laughs> he's all, i'm good come get your oscar <laughs> but you have to come here first <laughs> yeah no no nah mail it no thanks Uh, and i don't know the exacts about his crimes but i do know it involves underage uh an underage girl and um he was found he was charged with uh um something statutory rape i'm sure is included 
something that makes him appeal. But that's not what we're talking about today. But we're not. We've got so more just, interesting content. Yeah, just fun little things that I know at some point during your things. Like little that's bonus all I'm pearls of I'm wisdom. Like, How am I gonna fit this in? That Roman's a pedo. Yes. <laughs> And maybe he's not anymore. I don't know. I don't know all the details. Once a pedo, always a pedo. Uh, pro- yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's just something I just It said. is also a good example of how Hollywood runs. How like. Yeah. No, Certain no, crimes nobody, are unforgivable. Nobody holds a be- it against him. No, it's absolutely he's still ridiculous. Wars. He's still making movies. And um, well, we've seen that story played out plenty of times. So yeah. I'll get on to my choices of drink for us today. I went with two today. Um, okay. One, because I know you have so much detail to it's give a us. Lo- it's not even it's, rich in detail. It's just a it's, significant story. Yeah, it's a significant yeah. story. Exactly. And that's what I mean by detail. It's like you just have a lot to go over. And um, uh, with that, I was like, you know, I found one beer that just the name. I was mm-hmm. like, that's perfect. But it's four cans is what I could get. I was like, I don't want to get eight of them because that's too much. But there was one name I had in my head that was like, there, I have to be able to find uh, a beer called this. Like, it would be so stupid for nobody to make this. And we luckily have um, one of, if not the largest liquor store in the world by us. And um, so they have a lot to mm-hmm. look at. So I went through, looked at everything. I found the perfect one I wanted to go with. Okay. Um, so originally I found one called Purple Haze. And I was like, that's great. Because uh, Charles Manson was very much like part of the hippie movement, all of that. So yes. smoked a ton of weed, uh, lots of LSD, um, you know, just the whole gamut. Mushrooms, everything. He was living that lifestyle. But weed was a huge thing for him. And one of the biggest names for weed, um, prob- and I-, I could be wrong, but at the time you probably were like, yeah, this is the best weed. It's Purple Haze. And like Purple Haze was, was just known, and it is actually, it is a, a type of, um, if I remember right, it's sativa. <laughs> um, and um, it, you know, it, it but it, it's that like one weed that almost everybody knows. Like when you say Purple Haze, you either think Jimi Hendrix um, or you think weed or you think both. Yeah. Um, I was going to go with Purple Haze, but then I came across Weld Works Brewing Company. They've got a bad boy called DDH, Evil Haze Factory. Oh my goodness! I felt like it needed to be said like that. No, and but I it, should even echo that. Like I should. I I think Charles Manson was an evil haze. Exactly. Just like all encompassing of the yeah. people around him. Yep. And it was uh he was he was able to soak people in. He and then yeah. His evil haze went out, and they were like, "What's reality? What's oh?" There's a quote re- that we're going to talk should about. I do? What shouldn't I do? And he just filled people with his evil haze, and yeah. you'll know the quote. Yeah, he just filled them. Uh, I'm sure he filled a lot of them. He did. <laughs> that's that's one thing I wasn't aware of, Charles Manson. I also have a second quote where he talks about that. But that's the only reason you really do that as a cult leader, is you know, yeah, some tail. Even even the women cult leaders, apparently, as we know now. Oh, you, you Sorry. Are, you're dying there a little bit. The haze got me. You aren't even drinking. <laughs> I was envisioning it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Charles Manson is just coming through. Listen, I, he, he knows I we're usually talk- his listen. His ears are burning. And he's like, so mm. I usually listen to music when I write, but I have like a writing playlist and it's all super chill for this one. I listen to like 60s music. And it just kind of got me in a place where I was like, I don't know. That seems kind of a cool way to live. Not killing people, obviously. But just like, Katie's, I'm going to travel and I'm going to just enjoy my days. I, I have a feeling that at some point Katie's going to try and just, talk me into like, let's create a free commune. Love. Let's go buy some Sounds land. Sounds lovely. And we're just going to invite like yes. those that we like. and uh, Just chilling with your friends forever. Yeah. I think it's... It, to the like soundtrack of the '60s, talking about these oh, people, yeah. I was like, "Man, I could do it." I could see it too. It sounds nice. We I don't want to go to work Monday. We spent a good amount of time listening to some '60s music last yeah, night. Yeah, I'm telling you, there's a different chill vibe to it. That it's my n- current not, vibe. 
Not, um, I'm not too keen on like early Beatles. I like when they get a little bit trippier and same with Beach Boys. Um, but speaking of Beatles, uh -huh. that's where I'm, I, I'm looking at the second. I option. wanted, I just wanted one name for a beer and I wanted strawberry fields because I know strawberries are often yeah. used in, in a blonde. Um, uh, and sure enough, crooked stave came through and they've got a beer. If this was on a beer menu, that's what I would order. Strawberry That sounds fields. delicious to me. Crooked Stave, Strawberry Fields. It's a blonde ale. Um, the other one's an IPA. You are going to drink it. You're going to enjoy it. Um, uh, I can drink it, but I'm not going to enjoy it. <laughs> You'll learn. <laughs> the more we do this. Yeah, all of a sudden, you're going to just be like, oh, I no. kind of like IPA. I will never. It's a double IPA, too. Oh, dear Lord. Awesome. All right, uh, but this one isn't. So we'll start with the heavier one. We'll okay. go go to the blonde uh, to give yourself a break. Um, but uh, the, the strawberry IPA's fields in a bigger can too, which is unsettling for me. Yeah, they charge a lot too. Four of those guys. Um, Crooked Stave yeah. is a brewery in Denver. We actually have some connections to them. Um, our, you know, Joe. Our I know Joe. I Joe. like Joe a lot. Yeah. Um, I do too. He's a great guy. He's got a good Mexican mustache. Some of the times that I see him and he just, he lives it up the way it should be. He's a kind person. He is. And I like kind he people. Is. He worked there for a while. Um, friends of friends of ours, um, Drew, uh, Nick and Justice friend. He worked there too. Just all the names. Um, yeah. I'm just, you know, trying to get Nick some and listeners. Nick and Justice family. Well, we've mentioned them tons of times. <laughs> Not Nick. Hey, Nick. Hey, hey. Just jazz. <laughs> um, and then I guess um, Drew, I think it's his girlfriend or something. They, she actually creates the art for the cans. And I oh, don't know. Wow. I don't wow. know if she did this can, but okay. Um, yeah, it's a pretty can. Yeah, she's very much part I of. I dig it. So we got some ties to Crooked Stave, and we haven't had Crooked Stave on yet, and. Um, I'm All excited. Right. They they make good beer. I I've had a lot of their. Well, beers. let's crack one open. All right, here's your D T H Evil Haze Factory. I what is the D D? Uh, H stand like for it's... Charles Manson was an evil factory. Let's just yeah, and that's the main point. Let's it. just get that out. I don't know. Double. It's like I didn't want to drink it so bad. I just double let it fall out of my mouth. Dosey haze. So Weldworks is where this comes from. That's in Greeley, Colorado. Um, for those that don't know Colorado, you maybe heard of Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, and Fort Collins has this kind of armpit area to the uh, southeast of them called Greeley. Not that Greeley is an armpit, but it does smell like one most of the time because they have their... Uh, their cattle ranches mm -hmm. that they have up there and yeah. they've got a slaughterhouse mm -hmm. big big slaughterhouse factory yep that smells really bad okay sorry so it tastes exactly like an ipa should taste which means i don't like it but that means it's oh. probably a really good ipa that's not for double it so feels very dry to me yeah and i know wine should be described as dry i don't think beer should be but it just feels like that which is interesting that the haze has a dryness to it because usually haze has a bit of a fruitiness, um, but it is double. So you have a double hoppiness is basically, and I'm guessing DDH is something like, I'm sure double and hop is in there. I don't know what the other D is. Double deadly hopply. Double. Ho hopply? I think it's hoppy. <laughs> <laughs> deadly and hoppy uh, demon double hops <laughs> evil haze factory re, re. dunkin donut hellraiser <laughs> dunkin donut hellraiser. i don't know it's... i like it. that's a, a if we have a brewery someday yeah that um, will be a beer that we make be, uh, dunkin donut hellraiser are we gonna taste the other one or wait let's wait okay yeah I so, mean, it's there's not much. It's blonde, strawberry blonde. We uh, we can we'll definitely say what we think of it, but it's not going to be uh, like this. Has a lot of flavors to it. I'm actually kind of surprised. Um, usually that double IPA. Um, how 
how do how would I describe it? It's got it's like crazy bold and hoppiness. This isn't it's not, almost not um, like crazy hoppy. It tastes like a regular IPA, but there's just a okay, little bit I, like of a dryness. Here's and what I think. A little a little bit more to it, but not the way I thought it was gonna be. I don't like IPAs because there's somebody if I could equate them to a person, there's somebody who comes up to you, punches you in the face, and then takes your wallet. And it's <laughs> like double suck because you got punched in the face and your wallet's gone. This one I is like somebody who comes up, doesn't punch you in the face, but then takes your wallet and it kind of sucks. But it sucks less than the one where the person punches you in the face because <laughs> it's not powerful. Like it, I don't yeah. hate it in uh, my mouth. Yeah. Um, Oh, like it doesn't, uh. <laughs> it doesn't make like my salivary glands pucker, but it absolutely tastes like an IPA. So I'm not yeah. digging it. So oh, uh, my happy. wallet got stolen, but nobody punched me in the face. So cheers. Goodness. <laughs> she just, cheers to that. Big can. She can't, I can't, can't handle, handle I can't handle Clink. big cans <laughs> under the microphone. Yes, she can. Okay. Um, I agree. Uh, though uh, the way I would describe an IPA is actually kind of opposite is that um, it's uh, yes, I'm going to give more from my wallet for it, but I'm getting more bang for the buck because the, the, the uh, ABV is always higher in it. Okay. And, um, and instead of punching me in the face, <laughs> it, it, uh, it, instead of it providing a, uh, let's just say I'm having a hot dog. It's not just a hot dog with ketchup, which I would like is a Bud Light, light beer, a lager, whatever. Instead, this is a Chicago dog. All right. I do got, like a Chicago dog. It's got peppers. It's got onions. Tomatoes. Got tomatoes. Celery salt. It probably doesn't have ketchup on it. No. It's just mustard. Absolutely or maybe no a hot sauce. Who knows? Um, there's just so much more in the same meal. Yeah, agreed. And an IPA. All so. right. Well, enough metaphors of what IPAs are like <laughs> in terms of people and food. I would say that a beer called Evil Haze is perfectly paired with a story about a very, very evil man. Wait. You were you were going really good there, but we didn't tie Strawberry Fields to Charles Manson at all. No, but here's were what you, I think's going to happen. I, we have spoken longer in this introduction which is totally fine with the longest script so what i'm going to do is i'm going to tell the story until about halfway mm. we'll find a natural stopping point we'll wrap up the episode just to give people a chance to like not listen to us for two hours yeah listen to Be us for one to. yeah then we'll come back we'll start oh. the second half and we'll talk about strawberry fields i think that feels more yeah natural who will forever be tied to a time period, the 60s, that can absolutely be described as hazy. Mm. On Monday, November 12th, 1934, in a hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, a 16-year-old girl named Kathleen Maddox gave birth to a little boy who would be known as No Name Maddox for weeks. Eventually, this little boy would be given the name Charles Miles Maddox. Maddox was yep. it? Just wow. we're just starting. The father no of no name Maddox. That's a way to start life. I know. <laughs> He's going to earn himself a name, and it's a name that people decades after his and everybody's heard of Charles Manson. Yeah, I don't think that most he people earned himself know, a name. Like well, not most, but I think there's a lot of people that know he is tied to something. Yeah, a lot of people probably actually think he is actually one that went in yeah. with a knife and killed everybody. Well, the father of this child remains a mystery to this day. However, according to charlesmanson.com, the boy's father is thought to be Colonel Walker Henderson Scott Sr. When told of Kathleen's pregnancy, this army man would flee Ohio and never return, leaving the boy to never know the identity of his father. Damn. Kathleen would go on to marry a man named William Manson. And Charles Maddox became Charles Manson. The couple would divorce in 1937, 
partially due to the fact that they both were severe alcoholics who would take turns disappearing for days at a time, leaving Charles to his own means of survival. Oh my gosh. How old is he at this time? He's under the age of nine. I yeah. Like that. I always equate it to one of my children that's around the age. I'm just like, I can't imagine her just. She, that is one of our children who I think would Actually, survive. she would make it. <laughs> yeah. Now, Charles's mother would eventually go to prison for armed robbery. And as a result, Charles would move to West Virginia to live with his aunt and his uncle. By the age of nine, Charles Manson was spending most of his life in juvenile reformatories, escaping numerous times only to find himself being sent to another one. When described, the child... Did you say escaping? Oh, yeah. He escaped (laughs) multiple times. (laughs) They always caught him, and they always sent him someplace else. little, Little Houdini, huh? Yes. When described, the child Manson was given the following attributes... Manson was a liar. He lied about absolutely everything. When in trouble, he always blamed someone else. Even as a boy, Manson was obsessed with being the center of attention. If this attention could not be attained through positive means, young Manson was more than happy to misbehave, to earn his desired recognition. He would eventually graduate from juvenile reformatories to actual prisons for things like petty larceny, armed robbery, auto theft, and burglary. What's larceny? Uh, It's stealing of some kind. I think stealing and selling. I looked up some things. I didn't look up larceny. I hear it all the time. I've never even thought about it until right now. Interesting. Should we pause and Google? Yeah, let's pause and Google. We're pausing. Pausing. All right, and we're back. Um, larceny. It is theft, as mm-hmm. you said. But instead of like uh, going into a store, um, it's personal, personal right. property that you're uh, stealing from somebody. Correct. So, yeah, if you go in somebody's house and steal something or on their property, steal something off yeah. the property. I would, but, yeah. It, yeah, I think burglary but is. not cars, because that's auto theft. Correct. Now, at one maximum security facility in Ohio, Manson would later describe that there he was the victim of, according to him, homosexual crimes. And while there, Manson himself would be caught raping a boy at knife point. Ew. I know. What age? He's less than 20. He's younger than 20. Fuck. So in 1954, at the age of 20, Manson was released from prison. The next year, he married a 15-year-old waitress named Rosalie Jean Willis. When Rosalie became pregnant, Manson decided that the couple needed to move from Ohio to Los Angeles. And you don't know how old he is when he He's 20. Oh, he's 20 or 20, 21. Mm-hmm. 20 and 21, he marries a 15-year-old. Yes. And what's color? I'm guessing California's laws are okay on... These are like the... F- 50s right i don't Um, i think times were free and loose yeah and back then you probably actually it wasn't uncommon to no for a woman correct so manson stole a vehicle to make the trip he would be caught for the crime and sentenced to three years which to be served in terminal island california which is grand theft (laughs) correct (laughs) manson's son was born in 1956 And Rosalie would name him Charles Manson Jr. Manson, serving his prison sentence, was not present at the birth of his first child. Now, during this incarceration, it was brought to Manson's attention that his wife wanted a divorce so that she could marry another man. This was unacceptable to Manson, so he decided he would try and escape prison. But alas, Manson would be caught, and as a result, he would lose his chance at parole and early release. Rosalie would divorce Charles Manson in 1958 and remarry. When she did, Charles Manson Jr. became Jay White. Now, as a side note, Jay White, Manson's firstborn child, would die due to self-inflicted gunshot wound in 1993 in none other than Burlington, Colorado. 
Really? Yes. Because that was my, I've been trying to hold on to that thought, like ask her about what Charles Manson Jr. is doing right now. Well, we've got another Charles he's Manson Jr. Feet, that we have to talk about. six feet under right now, the first yes. one. Um, and he actually died in our state. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Burlington, where is that? Do you know? Um, I feel like I want to answer, but I don't actually know. So it'd it's be a, like me defining larceny, which I didn't actually know. <laughs> <laughs> which we don't need a pause for. I'll just I'll, Burlington, I'll look Burlington, Colorado. I think it's out east. I think it is too. Um, I feel like it's by like Fort Morgan or something. Burlington, CO. Oh, let's see here. It looks like. <clears throat> Where is it at? So Colorado has two sides. We have mountains and we have plains. And oh, I'm no, guessing it's, it's closer to like Sterling. Um, but that's still east. Yeah. Yeah. East of Denver. Straight east of Denver. You uh, well, you go past like um, Lyman. You know where Lyman yeah. is? So Lyman's like, I don't know. 45, 50 minutes away from Denver East. Lots of people actually speculate that, that it was his inability to not be tied to his father that contributed to his choice to oh, take his I own bet. life. I bet. And yeah. to change your name to Jay White, like you are, A, you're just not very creative. Well, just I'm thinking maybe the, his like, middle name, name was Jay. <laughs> he took his new uh, dad's but last it name. Has an, it, like, there's no tie to Charles Manson. I also like, think it it's super like interesting. It. There's no words saved from it. That I think it was pre his dad doing what he did that he made that choice. So I'm wondering if really? Manson's first wife just kind of knew that there was something evil inside of Charles Manson. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Especially, well... I think I think I've mentioned this before on one of our podcasts, but you mentioned that he was just known to lie. He was a, he liar. Was a liar. You could not mm-hmm. trust him. I've known a couple people like that, and it is weird. Like, yeah, you can just you imagine? Know they're lying hey, about so much. Hey, honey, we're gonna move to Los Angeles. I'm gonna go pick up a car. And he shows up in this lovely car and he's like, hey, look at this amazing car that we have. And then they get pulled over on the way and the officer's like, hey, this car is stolen. And she's just like dumbfounded. Like, what yeah. the heck? Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's con artists. Con yeah. artists are constant liars and some are better than others. They can well, cover it up and make Manson it look was amazing. like. Yeah. And it sounds like he's honing his skills right now. Yes. Manson would be released from prison in large part due to a letter written to the chief U.S. probation officer in the United States, a man named J. Noble Wright, written by T.R. Kildall, who was the chief of some department called Classification and Parole. Here is a portion of that letter. Despite the unsavory history outlined above, I believe there is a possibility this young man may yet be salvaged. He is not a mental deficient. He is of good appearance, and he has demonstrated at times a very real determination to attain a normal way of life. He is emotionally underdeveloped and twisted, and his reaction to situations of stress have often been juvenile. However, I do not believe this young man will achieve emotional maturity in an institutional setting. In fact, I believe he is over-institutionalized at the present time and that a lengthy period of incarceration would only serve to accentuate the unfavorable aspects of his case. Wow. And I just wonder if they ever like sat down and realized like who was the man that they released from prison. Well, and it's it's a little eerie that um, this guy who wrote that letter at the end, it, it, he predicts, like, if he spends too much time in these areas, he's going to turn into something. Which he, his entire, like, childhood from the age of nine, he was basically institutionalized. Now, Catherine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best. And not talking about anything that we're going to do on our next podcast. Okay. Because we're going to keep talking about yeah. Charles Manson. I'm going to, I'm just going to do my best. Okay. 
just just I'm, you should be I'm making saying. notes for things that you want to like think about because you know what the next topic is. But yeah, that's a good idea. don't say anything right now. I'm going to I'm going to get some paper and make some notes. Now, once out of prison, Manson would marry another woman named Leona Ray Stevens. Candy, as she preferred to be called, would basically be pimped into sex work by Manson. Manson was arrested again in 1959 for forging a treasury check, which would position Manson squarely before a judge with the potential of a 10-year prison sentence. Candy... Our child is calling us. Is that yours, phone? Hey, babe. Hey, mom. What's up? Uh, can I have a sleepover at Sophia's tonight? Candy, now pregnant, stood before the judge and with tears in her eyes pleaded with the judge to show leniency. In the end, this judge would hand down a 10-year suspended prison sentence. Now it's time for a quick legal lesson from a layman. And that, he doesn't, like, 10 years, but he doesn't serve in prison, right? Correct. So a suspended sentence can be given by a judge in lieu of sending the criminal to prison or jail as long as the individual meets certain requirements. Is that for the full 10 years? Yes. So he has to be clean for 10 years? With, much? yes. With, with the whatever. condition that if the criminal ceases to meet those specific requirements which usually includes avoiding breaking any further laws, they can then be sent immediately to prison. Okay. Now, just as a side note about Manson's second child, Candy says that she gave birth to Manson's second son, a boy given the name Charles Luther Manson. Luther. Yes. But considering Manson was her pimp and she was engaging in sex work, I'm not sure this can be assumed to be 100% Actually, true. Is. Now, today, Manson's second child is living somewhere in his 50s, and he is completely unconnected to his infamous father as he has long since changed his name. I wonder if he ever did a and we don't, DNA <laughs> testing. I don't know. I, I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> I would. I would have to, right? It's just like I don't know I how you would know. acquire Manson's DNA, though, I'm to sure test there's, it. There's enough of like somebody out there that at least you'd be able to know. Well, his half brother's dead, so that's not an option. Well, his, his actual son was alive till. Yeah, 92. but in doing the test, then he's drawing attention to himself, and I think he wants to. But not even have like anything to do ancestry with or something that's super private. I don't know. I don't know. I would at least do that and be like, do I, like, if the blood is completely different than yeah. what Charles Manson's oh, bloodline saying. Saying. is, then you know, like, oh, he's probably not my father. Yeah. But if it's similar, then you're like, damn, can I get a hair from that guy? Yeah. Well, in 1963, Manson would find himself divorced for a second time. So he is not of a marrying type. But back to Manson. It's hard to be when you're in and out of jail. I mean, I know. The struggle's real. (laughs) In 1960, um, so just a year after receiving his suspended sentence, Manson would be arrested on Federal Man Act charges, which these have to do with transporting people across state lines for sex work. They're meant to stop sex trafficking. Now, this would result in him being immediately sent to prison to serve the remainder of his 10-year suspended sentence, which now is like a hard sentence. It's hard to imagine Charles Manson, as we know, and picture him in your head with a purple <laughs> pimp cap on and <laughs> fur, fur coat. I don't think that's what he wore. Purple long, long coat. <laughs> No, I... pants. Uh, it's just hard to see that. Driving big ass Cadillac. No, I don't think that's what it looked like. Get out there, ho. <laughs> Go get candy? me my money. Come on, Candy. All right. I'm leaving you. <laughs> In 1967, Manson was released from prison and he headed to San Francisco. With him, he took his newfound love or obsession of the Beatles, a recently developed skill of playing a still guitar. And a dream to make music. Uh, why not? You know what? It's hard out there for a pimp. Yep. He's, he's trading well it in. Might as well go make some music. He's going to make it. I actually think you make it better as a pimp than as a musician. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, in San Francisco, Manson began acquiring several female followers who he would refer to as the family. Okay, but, this is where, like, this was the one part that I'm very, like, the pimping um, history actually kind of makes sense to lead to following. But did he intentionally, did you read anything if he, like, intentionally was like, I'm going to go to California, I'm going to become a guru? I don't like think that was his guy. intention. He wanted to make it in the music you industry. You think these women just kind of like latched onto him and he they was like They talk about oh, how during this time period to this. these very middle class from a regular family girls move out west to California in search of love yeah. and freedom my mom might and hippie have idea been one of them. I know. maybe not i don't you know but that so they show up and i think manson just being him found that he had some sort of gravitational pull with these ladies and i think they met a need or desire that he had and so he just started to come this way that's him plucking them off the off the, the bushes the lady trees yeah <laughs> Yes. Now, he called them the family, but a more accurate description of the situation is probably that Manson was acquiring cult followers. Yeah, and I, that's what I want to know, like, where in his mind he I'm decided. I'm not sure like, that. This is, there's something here. This is what I'm going to do. Or, I mean, at some point he had to realize, like, what, like, oh, this is the way. So I'll tell you this. This podcast, unless we wanted it to be 30 hours long, cannot go into detail about the just more run-of-the-mill details about Charles Manson, which aren't even run-of-the-mill because Charles Manson's life was oh, yeah. effed and ridiculous. Yeah. But if you really are interested, Helter Skelter is the book to go to because okay. there's a lot of regular things, which aren't regular, but for Manson, they're much more regular than he's some cult leader. Yeah led to him making the choices that he did. And really, that was the only part so, I had questions about was that transition. Also, yeah, yeah. it does tie to our next episode and how, right. like, what is like the... What actually the happened to The open Charles knowledge Manson. of like his... Oh, the, I yeah. decided to do this at this point. Now, Mary Bruner would be his first follower. Lynette Squeaky Frome, Patricia Krenwinkle, Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, which I can say that name all the time. I don't know why right there I struggled. Kasabian. Kasabian and Leslie Van Houten would follow, joining Manson's little family or little cult over the next few years. At first, Manson and his family moved to Topanga Canyon, which is west of Los Angeles. It was at this time that Manson made several efforts to make music world connections. One such attempt was with a man named Terry Melcher. Melcher was a music producer as well as being Doris Day's son. Do you even know who Doris Day is? The name sounds familiar. I'm not. I can't tell you who she is. She is a an iconic Hollywood actress. Not to the level of like Marilyn Monroe. Doris Day though. Huh? Yeah. And nor uh, what's the other one? The Tiffany Breakfast at Tiffany's lady. Audrey Hepburn. Yeah, she was big at that time, too. Doris Day. Calamity Jane. I watched that movie over and over at my grandparents' house, and it started. Calamity Jane. Yeah. It sounds like an awful movie. Oh, it's fantastic. Now, when Manson's first studio session, so which was... Doris Day was one of the followers? No. Wait, what were Are you saying? not even listening? Wait, why'd you bring her up? Terry Melcher, who was a music producer... Oh, yeah. Who is yeah, the for, son of Doris Day. Uh, Beach Boys. Correct. Gives Charles Manson... Manson. Manson. <laughs> Charles Manson an opportunity to do, like, a studio audition. Oh, okay. And he fails. But what's interesting about Terry Melcher, at the time that he was interacting with Charles Manson, Melcher called 150 Cielo Drive home which that address is incredibly important later in the story. Is that a, a Tate address? Yes. Weird. Really? So he calls that address. No, that's where he lives. Melcher's renting Melcher. the home. Okay. 
offers Manson an opportunity opportunity to do like a studio test. I don't know what you call it in music lingo. And it doesn't go well. Oh, and Melcher's audition. like, I'm going to, I'm going to pass Charlie Manson, but you keep on keeping on. Huh. And later when Charlie Manson has to pick an address, he picks, he happens to address. choose the address where Terry Melcher was living at the time. At the time. Yes. Okay. Go on. I am. Oh, why'd you bring up Doris Day? Because I love Doris Day and nobody knows Terry Melcher. People know Doris Day. He was producer for Doris Day. I got you. I, no, he or, was uh, Doris Day's uh, son. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me tell you, I dig his style. If you look up a picture of Terry Melcher. I was going to say, Doris Day like, looks old. Like, even, like, there's not, there's like one young picture of her. Well, she had a grown son in the 60s. Yeah, she was old. She was old. So uh, now she's she dead. Was Calamity Jane. <laughs> Yes, by the light of the silvery moon, which was a Christmas Pil- special. Pillow talk. Doris Day, Back in people. Know Doris Day. Oh, I can't man. believe you don't. Anyway, no, I don't that was a moment either. of the podcast <laughs> where I wanted to be like Terry Melcher. Melcher called 150 Cielo Drive home. That's crazy. Terry Melcher is his name, right? And yeah. he was. He was a. a um, He's a music producer. Producer for um, at least Dennis. Wilson of the Beach Boys. Okay. I think Which for... is a nice transition to this next little right. tidbit. So next, during the spring and summer of 1968, Manson, along with some female Manson family members, are going to find a new place to stay. Mm. The Beach Boys were arguably one of the biggest American bands in music during this time. Manson found room and board, whether... Dennis Wilson knew it or not, (laughs) at Dennis Wilson's home, the drummer for the Beach Boys, at one point even writing a song entitled Cease to Exist, which was released by the Beach Boys as a single on the B-side of the 2020 album. The well, name not 2020 album. That's what it was called. Oh yeah, 2020. Sorry, it's like You're, 2020 vision. Sorry, yeah. I was thinking dates because we no no 20 dash or like yeah slash like vision, dash vision. You yeah. have 2020 vision. Now That's the name of that song would be changed to Never Learn Not How to Love. The name of that Cease song to exist. when they put it out was Cease to Exist. Mm-hmm. So strange, and no wonder they changed it. Yeah. It's a cool song, though. We listened to it last mm-hmm. night. It's actually a cool song. Like, it's. I. It's the, a. I it's a song that you would have what, on a like, CD and it'd be in like the number six spot, and you listen to it once, and you never uh, listen to it again. Or, there was nothing special. I like Terry Melcher would have said, "Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for trying. No, just, just keep it up." No, and if I would have let him go. If you're a bit of a music nerd, no. it would have been like it would have been like one of those. You're like, hey, I want you to play this band. But no radio tracks. Let's do hidden hidden tracks only. And that would have been one of the songs you wanted them to play. Mm. I think it was that Agree good. Agree to disagree. I think it was that good. Now, these good vibrations at the Wilson's Ooh, home. <laughs> vibrations. <laughs> yeah, I was going to sing it and I chose not to. But these good vibrations at the Wilson's home were short-lived. And Manson, along with his family, moved on to the Spawn Movie Ranch. Now, this rundown and almost defunct movie set located on what I think is interestingly named the Devil's Slide, keep that in mind, in the western side of what is now Santa Susana Pass State Historic Park, once hosted the filming of shows like Bonanza and The Lone Ranger. I was going to say, there's some big shows that were film there weren't there now the owner george spawn was 81 years old and blind when manson and his family decided to make the ranch their home george made an agreement with manson whom he generally seemed to like that manson and his girls could stay if they would work the ranch now working the ranch meant things like cooking cleaning doing repairs renting horses to tourists and to one lucky manson family member um, Lynette Frome taking care of all of George's needs. Ooh, wow. All. Good for you, George, before you go out. <laughs> That's a good deal made. Um, Spawn Ranch, yeah. uh, probably its biggest movie that it was used for is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 
They but actually, that was after. I know. But they actually did film it there, which is pretty cool. Now, actually, you mentioned, like, good for you, George, before you go out. Manson actually envisioned a time in which George would sign over the rights of the rants. I bet. To From A. But his unwillingness to do so probably enabled him to keep living when it would have been much more convenient for Manson to have him gone. Yeah, he's like, I know Charles is going to steal. <laughs> he's trying to steal this. I'm, I'm staying awake. I'm watching. I'm watching that deed. He was making blind. Sure nobody... He couldn't watch. Oh, well, I'm in his <laughs> his. Uh, I don't know. He f- he's feeling. He and feeling Manson everything would have Hearing like everything. just very deep conversations. Like they would talk about huge existential things. Now, I bet he knew Charles wanted the ranch and he was like hey i like you but not that much yeah now it was here at the spawn ranch that manson solidified his role and control as the manson family cult leader leading his followers to believe that charles manson two-time divorcee convicted criminal failed musician was none other than jesus christ now manson had a type he liked middle-class american girls These girls seemed specifically susceptible to Manson's charm and his charisma. One of his followers, Leslie Van Houten, would later state, he was like Christ. He had the answers. Manson perfected the art of exploiting the vulnerabilities of his followers. If they lacked confidence, he knew exactly how to use that shortcoming to strengthen their connection to him. For example, Patricia Krenwinkel, a less attractive family member would be told that she was ugly. But Manson was also ugly. And together, they would be the ones, the only ones, who would tell each other that they were beautiful. When the exploitation of shortcoming was not enough to bind these young, impressionable youth to Manson, Manson would use isolation to ensure his family's dedication. Family members were forbidden from talking about their past. They weren't allowed to celebrate their birthdays. Manson went even as far to forbid watches. You, he's erasing their identity. His goal was to have his family members disappear and disconnect from anything other than Manson himself. Sounds like uh, Scientology a little bit. He actually, I had to cut it out because it's the longest script ever. He pursued Scientology for a while. No shit. Along with some other <laughs> religions. That's like the beginning of Scientology yes, right around But then. right in California. Oh yeah. Yeah. And and Hollywood call it now, California. This is particularly interesting. Manson utilized drugs like marijuana and L S D to make the grand things he said seem true. After feeding his family members tablets of acid directly from his hand into their mouth like some like twisted commun- communion, like communion yeah. in honor of the last supper manson would reenact the crucifixion yeah leading his family members to be certain he that was manson was god on earth yep. yep now what the cia failed to accomplish manson succeeded and effect- effectively utilized psychotropics as a mode of mind control. And for everybody to know, I keep referencing our next episode. It's gonna be so good. Kitty just brought up an alphabet <laughs> company yes. in our federal government that we're gonna now we're gonna talk about his their just ties put a pin in that. to Manson. Now another method of mind control was through group sex. It was especially effective in terms of recruiting and controlling new male members of the family. I would definitely be <laughs> controlled by group sex, for sure. <laughs> Women would readily yeah. be offered up to the new male cult members. Oh, yep, yeah, I'd be in. Without a choice center, or an option. You want me to do. Now, in fact, in 1994, when asked directly what family members were drawn to, Manson replied this. <clears throat> I try to do my best, Manson. What they really liked about me? You want to really hear? I fucked real good. (laughs) (laughs) 
Now, <laughs> that D was good. <laughs> another person would describe family members like this. They were empty shells filled with Manson's rhetoric. And full of this rhetoric, these empty shells will prove that filling empty people with dangerous ideas is a very, very dangerous thing. Mm. Yeah. Filling them with dangerous ideas and a bunch of sperm, it's just not. <laughs> well, you are like on fire. Damn, Transition. I'm just hitting it. Transition. Now, at some point during this period of time, Manson would father his third known child. Manson. What, what's his name? <laughs> oh, it's a cute name. Okay. Manson and the first family member, Mary Bruner, whom Manson met in March of like 67 and would later go on to give her the name Mother Mary. They would welcome a little boy on April 15th, 1968. This little boy would be named Valentine Michael Manson, but would go by the nickname Pooh Bear. Now, this little boy would live with the Manson family until Mother Mary was charged with credit card fraud. And after a significant police shootout in 1971, she would be arrested. Holy shit. Mother Mary. Mother Mary. That he, no wonder he was in love with her. He's like, I'm going to have a child with this woman. Well, this woman is nuts. Maybe more nuts than me. But well, I'm smarter, so. Pooh Bear. He actually wasn't very intelligent. He was like almost illiterate, Manson. Oh, well, that doesn't mean. He had different intelligences. Yeah, there's the, you know, common yeah. sense, street smart uh, now, intelligence. <laughs> Pooh Bear Valentine would go on to live with Bruner's parents when he was just 18 months old. Michael Bruner, as he would be known later, so he also changed his name, grew up completely away from the Manson family in Eau Claire, Colorado, or Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Excuse me. Yeah. Bruner? Yeah. But he, he is actually a son of Manson. As far as we know. Does he only have sons? That's, yep, I guess. Now, sperm is strong, in November of 1968, the Beatles would release the White Album, and on it would be a song entitled Helter Skelter. This song must have burrowed itself deep inside of Manson's mind. And from that burial, a terrifying idea would grow that would set into play a series of horrific events. Manson believed that the playground slide referred to in the song Helter Skelter was actually a reference for inciting a race war between white people and black people in the United States. Now, Paul McCartney has stated that the metaphor was actually in reference to the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. But who needs actual facts when somebody believes himself to be the son of God? Manson would promise his family members that he would save them from the worldwide chaos that would accompany Helter Skelter. Or he was brainwashed. It's a whole lot of things. It was a Manchurian candidate. You're, Helter Skelter. Don't, don't steal anyway, the thunder of um, the next one. So Helter Skelter is an interesting song off the White Album. The White Album really, truly was like revolutionary as far as the sound. The toes. And the, the different... the. Uh, Helter Skelter was an interesting song. When you listen to it now from our point of view, you're just kind of like, ah, yeah, you know, it's a it's an old song. But when you actually listen to it and pay attention to the age it came out of, no songs sound like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe like a Rolling Stones song kind of was going there, but no songs had this like punk rock, fast rock beat, screaming for the words feeling to it yeah it is a very interesting song and then the lyrics alone are just like which a lot of the white album is that way it's the white album just feels encrypted for the most part like oh, so many of the songs i mean they're talking about like like there was conspiracy theories about uh paul being the walrus i forget what song it's in but like Conspiracy theories came out that Paul McCartney actually died, and the Paul McCartney everybody was seeing isn't the real Paul McCartney. Here's something I want to mention. And they say they like tell everybody because my that husband album. will talk about music all day, every day if he could. Um, what I find interesting is that we like mentioned there are these conspiracy theories, but on another episode we talked about how kind of during this time period bands absolutely like laid into the notion oh, yeah. that they were devil worshippers yeah. because it equated to sales. 
I'm sorry. I can totally see them writing these like twisted, yeah. creepy little um, Easter egg songs yeah. because it got people buying their albums. Hundred percent, and it was smart. Like, well, I mean, you just listen to the Beatles compared to everybody else. There's no wonder somebody would be obsessed with them. Somebody like Charles Manson, and obviously millions of other people, but somebody like Charles Manson, who is a musician trying to make it. Yeah. He, he obviously loved the Beach Boys. Beatles came into to America and just were like, Beach Boys who? And everybody yeah. else was like, Beach Boys who? Oh my gosh, this is the Beach Boys 2.0, 3.0. Um, yeah. And then they just continued doing that. Like They played music on the moon while everybody else was here on Earth. Exactly. Exactly. Good way to put that. I like yeah. that. So, after a bad drug deal with a member of the Black Panthers, Manson seemed to connect some dots. Manson believed he was to be the one to start the race war. He would do this by framing the Black Panthers for horrific crimes, like, you know, murdering wealthy white people. (laughs) And as the race war raged, Manson and his followers would hide, then believing the black population would win the war but would have no idea how to govern themselves once they won, Manson would emerge and simply take over. That was his plan. Solid plan. Solid (laughs) plan, bro. Now, it was on August 8th. I'm in. Solid plan. (laughs) Sharon Tate, Jay Sebring, Warcheck Frykowski, and Abigail Folger enjoyed a late dinner at El Cajote Mexican Restaurant in California, which is still like a functioning restaurant. Even after COVID? I think so. (laughs) The foursome left the restaurant around 9.30 p.m. and drove back to the home that actress Sharon Tate rented with her director husband, Roman Polanski. The group traveled up the long drive at 150 Cielo Drive and were greeted by the Christmas lights left up by the former tenant, Candace Bergen, then girlfriend to music producer, Terry Melcher none of them even suspecting the evil that probably at that moment was headed their way. Um, so are you going to go into the Beach Boy tie at all? We already did. But <laughs> the, I know, I bet the, like, how Terry Melcher was also like, Oh, I didn't mention that. that. So, okay. so um, you can definitely describe that because I, I did you not. You did bring up, the, I mean, obviously I brought it up and then you, explain it but terry melcher being again i can't remember if it's just dennis allen or dennis wilson's um uh producer manager whoever he was to him or if it's all the beach boys either way there Mm -hmm. was a connection to dennis wilson and um it was through uh terry munch Munch? no it was through the beach boy that manson was introduced to melcher Okay, so, so Dennis is the one that drummer, introduced him. Drummer boy Wilson yeah. introduced Manson when he was basically squatting in his home. So the way it's known that he met a, a Beach Boy, Dennis, um, and those that don't know, Beach Boys have three brothers in there. They're all Wilsons. There's like Brian, Dennis, and I can't remember the other one. Um, so Dennis was a drummer, also a backup singer, um, and he would write a song here and there for the beach boys. And he was driving down the road and he saw these two, uh, good looking ladies hitchhiking. He passed them. Cute little hippies. Yeah. And he, and this is like in Hollywood, he was driving. And then, you know, he, uh, later in the day, he sees them again and he decides to pick them up and they bring them and he brings them back to their, <laughs> to his house. And, um, you know, they're talking about everything. And Dennis Wilson was really into Maharaji at the time. He's telling them about it. And they're like, well, we have a guru too. And his name's Charles. And that's where um, the, the the connection happens. And, and then <laughs> the way it's said is like Charles actually just showed up at Dennis's and house. And there. <laughs> and basically just squats there. <laughs> so ballsy, Charles. Oh, man. It was just like... But he had that, he must have had that uh, cult leader, like, thing about him where he could just, like, show up, shake a hand. 
and do live a smile for and just be like, an entire let season. Let me tell you about the philosophy of life. And you would just be so enthralled by him that you'd be like, yeah, you and your 17 women could come in here. <laughs> Although it wouldn't take much like smarts from Charles. You just show up with 17 women. And you're like, can we live here? And most single guys would just be like, yes, please. Yeah. You guys take all the other rooms. I'll stay in the basement. Like, I'll sleep on the couch. <laughs> now, the night of August 8th, Manson family member Charles Tex Watson, who I'm just going to call Tex or Watson, would receive instructions from Charles Manson that murders needed to happen and that these murders needed to be as, quote, gruesome as you can, end quote. <laughs> 